Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Lit RPG Podcast. I am Ramon here, here to bring you the latest Lit RPG news, reviews, and of course, author interviews. This is episode number 110 of the show, and I have six new reviews just for you folks at home. Uh, before we begin, I want to give a quick shout out to a new Patreon supporter for the podcast, Conan Wally McCain. Uh, hopefully he and I can actually schedule a nice chat soon. Uh, it's one of his Patreon rewards, so thank you, uh... Thank you, Conan, for, for being such a great supporter. If you want to be a supporter, too, you can find out all the ways to do so at patreon.com slash Podcast. I know it doesn't say Little Pity Podcast. That's just <laughs> what it ended up being. But you can go there and help support the podcast and get some nice little rewards, too, for, for your support. So thank you. Uh, but we begin the show, though, with letting you know which novels and stories we're going to talk about this week, including Apocalypse 2020, Look at the Skies, in my James T. Witherspoon. Uh, also be giving a review for The Cloud or Cloud Dungeon, Fairy Wonderland. Uh, then after that, it'll be Total Quest, Total VR uh, 1. Then after that, I'll be giving you a review for The Wayward Bard, World of Chains, Book 1 by Lars M., member of the Lit RPG community, so real fun. Looking forward to talking about that one. Uh, and then it'll be Countdown, Reality Benders, book number one. And then last but not least, The Iron Veil, uh, a Lit RPG Omni World Adventure. So there you go, folks. Um, and of course, begin the show, though, with Lit RPG News. And in Lit RPG News, uh, we begin with some actually some really very nice um artwork that was released by luke timlenko uh he it, it's this wide angle almost like background picture thing like it almost like it's a little harder to fit on the uh the show notes for the show which i'm showing the video version of the podcast um but it, it's really pretty like you see the main characters uh forging stuff it, and like this is really like nice stuff like it cost it could probably cost a bit to, to get it done and he's given it away for free good stuff might be a reward for his patreon subscribers but really pretty stuff so thanks luke for for sharing that with us uh also in artwork news i guess <laughs> uh villa silly Mahingo released another piece of artwork for his character uh anastaria it's a black and gray cover art piece uh that shows off her in her full plate mail stuff um i think she's a paladin in the story but this is for the way the shaman series this is one of the characters looks very nice i'm like oh this is this is good stuff i'm, I'm actually a fan of black and white um artwork so this really works well for me with lot, lots of nice little details very nice okay uh in other little bitchy news uh aleron kong met brandon sanderson at a convention uh, so he kind of geeked out about that and he, he shared it on Facebook with everybody. He actually got a video <laughs> of Brandon Sanderson holding his book. Um, I even think he took him and his wife out to dinner at some point. Uh, so like Adlerin is definitely like knocking this out of the park. Like he's networking like crazy. Uh, Brandon Sanderson looks in the photo that I'm showing in the video version of the podcast. Um, he looks like he might be crying out for help. Like sending blinking signals, like SOSs, but Alan looks like he's he's just having a ball, standing next to a, 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 a an author he admires a lot. So good for him. I think he uh, entitled the photo Kaladin and Richter just chilling. Uh, you can of course go check out the photo in the link in the show notes or in the video version of the podcast. So there it is. Um, also in Little Bitchy News, um, I did a serious drinking with Charles episode. Um, Charles Dean, author of the um, War of Eternity series, the Bathroom of Night, and the Merchant Tikva series. Um, he he's trying a new format out for his his Drinking with Charles thing, where he asks authors serious questions that he has about their novels. So it's a little more like novel uh, based, but these are novels he's actually written and just like issues he might have with the story and the author. Uh, answers questions about them. Uh, some people in, in 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 chat think he's uh, he's poking a little bit too much, um, but uh, Charles Dean's questions are always very thought provoking, and they're for, for me as an author, I'm, I always think they're very good because they they're like critiques from somebody I respect and somebody I, I'm friendly with. Um, so I don't mind the questions, and they all, all, all the critiques help, really help me point out, oh, these are things I could be working on as an author, or just just having like a good conversation. Um, but the banter is fun. He also did another one of these with um, Blaze Corvin. They got a lot more drunk than I did 
when I did it with him. Uh, so it's probably a more interesting one for you guys to watch, but it's still very fun. Go check out the link in the show notes uh, to, che- to see those episodes. Okay, uh, and other little bit of news. This is really fun. This is a really fun story for me. Uh, Dakota Kraut, he's a friend of mine, but he's also a little bit author. He writes the Divine Dungeon series and also The Ritualist. Um, he made a really big announcement this week. He said, uh, and this is his post quotes, Huge announcement. Thank you all for your support. I'm taking a leap of faith and becoming a full-time author. Um, so that's his announcement. There's also some more information um, that he he's you know pumping up his Patreon support. So um, for folks who want to help support him in becoming a full-time author, uh, who just love his work and want to see earlier versions of it or get some other rewards, you can have a link in the show notes to his Patreon page so you can go help support him there. Um, but the, like the Patreon stuff um, is probably not going to be like the majority of the money that authors make, but it is like nice regular income to help pay bills between like you know the royalties that we get like every few months from like Amazon and stuff. So it's really helpful. Uh, and plus, as as readers. Um, you get some really cool rewards, like early, like months early versions of like their stories or input on characters or like thought, you know, thought processes, become beta readers or just like sometimes signed books. And there's lots of great rewards. So go check it out. So go support Dakota uh, if you can, if you like his stuff. So, but again, congratulations to Dakota for making that huge leap, man. That, that's good. Happy for you. Okay. Um, there was an issue recently, and this is the next story, with Feral, Feral number nine. Uh, it's a Russian trans- uh, novel that's translating into English by Lit World. Um, it was released recently, but instead of people getting that book, which they you know, were expecting reasonably, uh, instead they got a version of book number eight. Uh, and Lit World, the publishers, uh, were notified very quickly, and they worked uh, to upload the correct manuscript to Amazon, and they've worked with Amazon to push updates to anyone that got the incorrect version. Uh, but readers might have to go to their Amazon accounts and look under manage your content and devices to get the update to the novel. They might have to manually upload it. Um, there's a link in the show notes for a shortcut to that particular section. You just have to look up Feral 9 and do the update. Um, Lit World also made a statement about the issue. There's also a picture of them saying, sorry <laughs> to all of us, I guess. Um, but this is their statement to the public. Uh, the Lit World publishing team apologizes for all the problems and mistakes with Feral 9, World and Steel by Andrea Vasilve. Um, if for any reason you haven't been able to get your book, send us an email to welcome at litworld.info or, the DM, or, or in the DM uh, on our Lit World Facebook page and we'll be happy to deal with the situation. So send them a message on Facebook or an email if you still are having issues getting the correct version of, of Feral book number nine. So... There you go. They're taking a proactive approach to, to, to recognize their error and, and, and be making steps to, to correct it. So there you go. Good for them. Um, in some sad news uh, this week, this is something that uh, just got posted about today. Um, Eric Cullum, who's the author of Reincarnation uh, RPG, he's reported on a post on Facebook that another lit RPG author has passed away. His friend... Uh, and I think I believe co-worker uh, David Pendleton, who's the author of Alpha Testing, there's a picture in the show notes for the book, if you don't remember what it is, uh, has apparently passed away at night. Um, this is part of his statement on that Facebook post. It had been a long goal of his, speaking of David, uh, to be published, and after I asked him to be a beta reader for my story, he was introduced to Little RPG. He began to start to reading as many as he could, and he saw Little RPG as an amazing experience not only to read, but to write. David started having breathing problems three weeks ago as he was finishing his novel and needed to have surgery. He published alpha testing before leaving for the hospital. I don't expect anything to go wrong, but if it does, at least I'll be a published author were his were the last words he spoke to me in person. Sadly, he did not recover, and after three weeks of intensive care, he passed away last night. Okay, so again, that's um, author Eric Holmines, um informing us of of, of David Pendleton's passing as an, as, as an author. So um, I've only corresponded with David um, by email. I, I don't know the man personally. But he seemed generally nice and interesting and uh, engaged in the genre and, and writing. Uh, when he asked me to review his novel, we had a brief conversation. He did mention um, how much he liked the genre and that Eric was the one who introduced him and turned him on to, to Lit RPG in general. Uh, so it's, it's sad to hear. And the man, of course, will be missed. Uh, so there you go. So a sad bit of Lit RPG news to end this particular section on. But of course, we begin um, the rest of the podcast. We're going to move into out now. So these are the stories that have out 
come out now. I haven't reviewed them, but they are out currently. Uh, so go check them out. And hopefully I'll have a chance to review some of them too. Including Fairwell number 9. That's out now. Ruled in Steel. I kind of fell out with this a little bit. So I'm probably not going to be reviewing it. But go check it out, guys. Uh, if you're a fan of the Fairwell series, it is out now. Uh, as is Branded. Book 1 of the Advocate Saga by Outspan Foster. Um, out, out now. He's the author of The Slime Gods. If you read that story. Uh, and out as well is Welcome to Eden, Little RPG slash Gamelet, that's what it's called. Um, there you go. Uh, out as well is Temple of Sorrow, a Little RPG and Gamelet Adventure, Stonehaven Legend League, League book number one. Okay. Uh, also out is Vesteria Online, book number two, uh, called The Void. So that one's out as well. Uh, Fjorgen, book number three. Yeah, book number three. Shifting Sands, uh, so that one's out as well by R.J. Castellan. And I know he told me how to say his name once uh, or a couple of times, and I'll have to look it up before I, I do the actual review so I know I get it right. Uh, but that is out now, so go check that out. Uh, and God of Life, Mythic Online is also out now. So all those things are out currently. Um, a lot of stuff just popped up this week, so have plenty to read in the next week or so for you guys. Okay, uh, these are new audiobooks that are out, including Fantasy Online, The Runestones of Trentinka. <laughs> That's going to be um, one of the books in the Fantasy Online series by Harmon Cooper, narrated by Jeff Hayes and Annie Ellicott. That's book number three in that series. Uh, Ascend Online, book number three is also on. That's Legacy of the Fallen. So that's uh, Luke Chimanko's story out as an audiobook. Uh, Dante's Immortality Beginnings. I uh, just reviewed that one last week. Had a really good time with it. Uh, got a 7 out of 10 for me as far as I can, the ebook version of it. Uh, Jeff Hayes and Sambo Theater uh, narrated it and they got it out relatively quickly after, after the actual book had come out. So good story, hopefully. I mean, I like the story. Good audiobook version. I know Jeff does good work. Uh, also out is Space Nights by Michael Scott Earl. First book of the series is definitely Little RPG, even if some of the later ones haven't done as much with it. Um, but book one, definitely Little RPG, had a good time with it, uh, and it is out as an audiobook. So there you go. Uh, on to upcoming Little RPG. These are just stories that are coming up in the future. Um, authors let me know about them, things I pick up on Amazon and find and organize. Uh, just me reading off a list of stuff, so feel free to skip it if you want to. But there are some new stories that are added to this list, including Cat Meister Online by A.J. Chaturi, out on April the 29th. Uh, You're in the Game, book number two, the short story collection from Russian authors, will be out on April the 30th. Prison Quest will be out on April the 30th as well. Uh, Eden's Gate, the arena, this is new to the list. Uh, this is book number... I want to say four, five. It's one of those. It's in there. Um, it's a, out on April the 30th, so coming very quickly. Um, the Ruins of Majesta will be out on May the 2nd. This one is actually written by um, Canadian member Tajel. So he's actually publishing it. I know he's been working on the word. I wrote on this one for a while, but he's actually putting it out to be published on Amazon. So I look forward to reading this one as well. Um, Questmaster will be out on May the 8th. Um, Mighty Your Steel will be out on May the 10th. Um, Blind Gambit will be out on May the 10th. Monster Hunter New York City by Harmon Cooper will be out on May the 10th. Um, World of Karnak out on May the 17th. On May the 24th, you will get a chance to read God Mode, Alter Game Book Number 3. Kingdom Level 5 will be out on May the 27th. Uh, on May the 28th, it'll be Trial by Fire, the second book in that particular series. May 30th, The Dead Rogue. And May 31st, Pangea Online, book number two. So they'll have that second book in the series to read. And last but not least, out on July the 10th, it'll be Restart, Level Up, book number one. This is another Russian story that's being translated into English for us to enjoy. So that'll be out way out in July. So stuff to look forward to. Okay, that's it. Uh, on to new releases and reviews. And in new releases and reviews, we have our first story up for review, Apocalypse 2020, Look to the Skies. Um, now, this is actually the second book in a series. And if you don't remember that first book is, I don't blame you. Um, even me knowing that it was coming out. Um, when I saw the cover art online, I was like, is that a new story? Who wrote that? Um, I think there's just like a little bit of a... Uh, a branding issue between the stories, but I'll show you the cover art for the first story so you remember what that one was. It's the Mad Max um, Fallout story. Uh, it looks like, let me see if I can pull it up. Yeah, there you go. Here in the show notes. It looks like this. So this is the one from 
the first book, Apocalypse 2020, a wasteland lit RPG by James T. Witherspoon. So um, if you like that story, this is the second one in that particular series. Uh, and honestly, it's, it's enjoyable. Um, it's just that the, the cover arts don't um, reflect that they're in the same series. And there's nothing really on the cover that says, oh, this is the second book in the series, in the second book in the Apocalypse 2020 series or whatever. And there's nothing online on the actual novel description that says that either. Uh, so... This is the second Magnet series, though. So um, I enjoyed it, though. James T. Witherspoon, nice story. But I'll read you the author's description so we can get into the more detailed version of that review. Um, after the final confrontation with Orion, Scarlet finds herself separated from her friends and becomes a leader of a small group of survivors. Meanwhile, Bran is a strange new character who starts far away from Dallas. As alien spacecraft roam the skies and new frightening creatures attack in the night, everyone must work together to defend themselves from this new threat. Outside of the game, Scarlet and Bran are now going to the same college and live only minutes away from each other. They have been happier, happy all summer, but their separation in the game is beginning to cause conflict between them in the real world. Um, there you go. There's the small one. Um, the first expansion uh, for Apocalypse 2020, Look at the Skies, introduces new survival mechanics, a a, a base building system, along with tons of new weapons, vehicles, enemies, and NPCs. Uh, and he goes on to say that this is uh, the first story is Wasteland Little G, and you should probably read that before you do this one. Um, this is 327 pages, $4.99. It's available on Kindle Unlimited. Um, and in full disclosure, I received an advanced copy of this for review. I purchased it when it became available. Um, now, the this story, the second of the series, actually takes place uh, almost immediately after the end of book one. Um, like, at the end of book one, there's this huge, uh, huge cliffhanger where it's like, oh, aliens are coming from the sky, the end. And uh, people, a few people were, were annoyed by that. And this one definitely takes takes literally like moments after the aliens are in the sky and they're fighting each other. Uh, and everyone who's human on Earth is just trying to scramble and survive and, and find a hideout to... to you know, to make sense or to make, to, to survive basically. Um, and there's a little bit of a recap as far as like what happens from book one. Um, uh, but there are fewer callbacks to like who individual characters are and their relationships. And this is again, definitely one of those series where you should probably read one book one before you try to jump into book two. Like it's not one of those series where you can just jump into book two and be like, Oh, I get everything. There was a nice summary recap. No, that's not what this is, unfortunately. Um, and honestly, I've, I've read book one and I enjoyed it, but even for me, it took me a little while to remember like who, who's Scarlet again? And what is her relationship to this other character? And, and who's this other person that you mentioned? And, and part of this is also that there's, this is a multi-perspective uh, narrative story, which means you have a bunch of different points of views telling this, this story. And so um, at the beginning of each, each chapter, you get like the name of the character, whether it's like in game or out game or like their character name versus their world name. Um, and so it feels like there's like 20, I mean, well, not 20 characters. There's actually, I think at max four, um, five or six, if you're including like game character names, I guess, but it's really like, it's really like three, three main perspectives. Um, but because of that, um, it, 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 it takes, it honestly took me a little while to just like remember, oh, that person is who again? Uh, and, but the author very gradually over the course of like making portions of the story does remind you, oh, this is who this is. This is the relationship with this person, et cetera, et cetera. And that's to like jog your memory, hopefully, and enjoy the story because it is enjoyable. Um, you also have to remember that um, in the real world version of, of the story, the portion of it, it takes place in the year 1997. So you're going to get a lot of like 90s references in the story, including like the X-Files and Final Fantasy VII just released. And I think there's even some um, Inspector Gadget jokes in the story, which I thought were super like nerdy and like, oh, that's you have to have like grown up in the 80s to kind of get that joke. But, you know, it's, it was it's like very entertaining for me, at least. Um this story version of this, the the in-game portion of it, takes place in this, um, like in book one, it was very Mad Max Fallout kind of thing, where it's, it's a post-apocalyptic story world. Um, there are basically two like main factions, the, the Raiders and um, players who are trying to make things better, basically, and there's a big conflict. Um, in this particular second aspect of the story, in the second novel of the story, um, the humans kind of merge together as one unit because there's a bigger threat. And so it's them versus the aliens that have come down. And there are, there are multiple factions within the alien section, which I won't spoil or anything. But um, there's a really cool thing that the author does with these stories in that 
each one of these novels is going to be apparently its own expansion pack to the game world as like the story like at the end of book one like the 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 team beat the game and then the developers millions installed the alien expansion pack they call it the um look to the skies which is why the title of the book is look to the sky because that's the expansion pack name for this particular game world and so with each expansion pack um new things are going to be added just like if it was an mmo um, including in this one, you get new aliens, you get new player races, you get new player classes. Um, there's an addition of like new game mechanics in this particular story that weren't in the first one. And that includes um, survival game mechanics, base building mechanics, and of course, lots of new quests about saving the world and storylines like that. So really, um, it's a really interesting approach to to writing a little RPG series. So I think it's very cool. Um, I also like the idea that, again, that each one of these are expansions. Um, and it's kind of an interesting way to justify like making changes to your world and, and, and kind of being able to like modify things that maybe weren't working for readers or for the author, um, or just like adding cool stuff. Uh, I think it's kind of neat. There's actually a portion at the end of each one of these books. Um, it's like the last like 8% some of it, whatever it is. Um, that's a game manual. And it just read, reads like a game and like, oh, these are the new additions to the game, including all the details about like all the care or all the different races and the new classes and their abilities in like great detail. Um, and it honestly just, I'm, I'm kind of a game mechanic nerd. I actually enjoyed reading like that game, that game manual thing. It, it was very like all, all the, all the crunchy details you would want. They're there, right there at the end. And um, it, it's just fun to see all the different possibilities for the classic. Cause you actually get more information than used in the actual novel. Like um, there, there are like power choices and ability choices that the characters just didn't get to. Cause they, they didn't need them or they didn't make those choices. Um, but all like the possibilities, like the expansion pack are in, in the end. And it's kind of fun just to see like, Oh, how would I plan my character using these new abilities and skills and classes and races and stuff. Uh, so that's enjoyable. Um, now again, the two biggest game mechanic changes in the story are survival mechanics and base building mechanics. Uh, now the characters, have to satisfy needs like thirst, hunger, discomfort. And if they don't, they start losing health points. Um, and this is kind of a really good way, at least to me, um, to give it a more of a post-apocalyptic feel. And there's more of a scavengery aspect to the story where it feels like, oh, this is definitely, um, has more of a, a, a I don't want to say zombie survivalist apocalypse thing versus like Mad Max survivalist, but you definitely have issues like, oh, people going hungry, having to eat weird, strange things to satisfy that hunger, or they're just not going to do well. Um, and also base building to produce the things they want to do. Um, and, and that kind of makes up a good portion of the early part of the story. So it was nice to feel... Um, that those things are interesting and important. Um, I, I wish there would have been more things to the base building, but it's again, it's a fun mechanic that's added and it's it's interesting to the story. Um, the real life portion of the story is a little more simple than the game portion of it. It's mostly like relationship stuff between like two of the main characters, Brandon and Scarlet. Um, the in-game storyline is actually really neat. I, I thought it was nice. I don't want to spoil anything, so I'm not going to give you too many details, um, but there are definite references to like alien movies of the time and i thought those were really cool interesting pulls out when it there's a particular point where it was like oh i recognize and like it's this movie that there's a pull for and i'm like oh that's neat um so there you go now i only have like one like this is also a com tiny complaint uh and it, this is something i mentioned for the first one as well i think is that the story is told from a, a multiple uh, multiple perspectives it's a multi-narrative perspective story uh so you can have multiple <laughs> points of views being told uh, for the story. And, and this is just not my favorite narrative structure. It's kind of the reason I couldn't get into Game of Thrones either. Uh, so I, authors in good company. Um, I like this story. I'm not saying I don't. It's just that it's one of those things that it's, um, that kind of narrative structure is very, it's kind of difficult um, and it's really challenging. There's some really cool things that can be done with it. You can tell stories from characters in different places and locations. And you kind of see how the how their how their storylines are going to cross eventually, and and they do, and it's interesting. And you can also like see um, different characters' perspectives in the same event, and it's really nice. And it's again a, a very interesting structure, but it does have its own challenges, including like not getting repetitive. Because when you have um, different important main characters in the story, and, and a big event happens, you end up 
um, giving the same big revelations multiple times, and that can get a little repetitive. And, the, and this happens in the story a little bit. And that there's a thing with the aliens, like one of their abilities. And the first time you see, it, you're like, "Oh, that I didn't see that coming. That was kind of cool." Um, and it's not as interesting the second or the third. Um, I think maybe a fourth time that, that, that same revelation happens to those char- other characters and it's ne- kind of necessary for the for the plot to go advance that everybody knows that this is a thing but at the time it's like ah oh, i kind of read that okay well we'll just move on so slight like i said tiny super tiny little thing um it's just one of those things like you know that's why i don't write in that in that in that narrative structure and it is challenging and the author for the most part does a really good job with it though um overall had a really good time with the story. Um, there were enough changes in the story and the game mechanics that it felt kind of fresh. Like this felt like a like a nice slight pivot, um, but it was still very friendly because you had the same characters, you had the same game mechanics from the last book, but you had in a new fresh stuff that it, it felt interesting and new. And I want to continue reading the story from beginning to end to see what happened. Um, again, the real life trailing is simple, but it's really cute. Um, and the game stuff had some really good surprises. So good for me. I had a good time with it. Uh, it's a score seven out of 10 for me. And that's apocalypse 2020. Look to the skies with the score seven out of 10. There we go. If you like book one, you would definitely like, you, you like book two. Okay. Next we have a uh, cloud dungeon fairy wonderland written by Nathan Valerio. Okay, this one is 315 pages, $4.50, um, and it is available on Kindle Unlimited. Here's the author's description. In the many parallel worlds filling the universe, Earth is a rare world which possesses the largest amount of interference from other worlds. The most common interference is the summoning of heroes and reincarnation. The story is no different, except that in the process of calling the desired people, the efforts of three goddesses were m- messed with causing the summon to not be older, the older brother or sister. Instead, a four-year-old child was summoned. Uh, backed by her love of fairy tales and folklore, we, sh- we shall see how this young child, with the help of her lazy best friend and pet cat, will change the very face of the world, starting from a tiny cloud and becoming a dungeon filled with any and all fairy tales she had in her head and watch. Um, so this is actually a dungeon master, a dungeon core story. Um, it has a, a, a slight interesting twist in that the the dungeon core is a reincarnated four year old child, uh, and so you get some very interesting um, mechanics. The the, the four year old child does not want to like kill people, and she doesn't also want ugly monsters, which translates to violent creatures. Uh, and instead, she wants to make a, a cloud city fairyland, and it's a very it's a very interesting premise and a very interesting starting point for her, for a story. It feels like a good writing prompt. Um, ultimately though, however, the story was a bit disappointing, at least for me. Um, let's see. Uh, okay. I mean, there again, some very interesting questions for it. Um, that, I mean, like, how do you create conflict without flighting if the character doesn't want to fight? Um, what are motivations for the characters to expand? What monster the ninja create she's, if combat is in the focus? And again, um, there's not much fighting in the story, so I'd be aware of that. There was like maybe five scenes, small scenes. Um, in like 350 pages where there is an actual like fighting and conflict. Uh, much of the early part of the story revolves around expanding the dungeon, making a variety of fairies and spirit creatures and like magical like story monsters and creatures. Um, it's an interesting exploration of what dungeon powers and a child's imagination can come with. Um, there's like generally the, the, the explanation like all these different creatures and their evolutions is neat. It, is, it really is. It's detailed and I liked it. Um... But where the novel kind of drops for me is in the conflict department. And I don't just mean like fighting. I mean like conflict in the larger sense. So like whether it's going to be ideological conflict, political, personality, moral, or any other kind of conflict. Um, there's just not much here. And to me, that's that makes the story a little too easy and interesting, unfortunately. Um, things just kind of run super smoothly for the dungeon. There is like there is some conflict. I already mentioned there's like five 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 fight scenes um but there's also like a really big setup towards like the i want to say the three-fourths mark of story when there's like another dungeon that's looking to get our our hero our main character our four-year-old uh cloud dungeon thing um and there's like this really big setup between like oh the peaceful fairy dungeon and this normal monster spewing dungeon and like and then it's like they're gonna the novel makes you think that there's gonna be like an actual conflict at some point and then it just kind of ends without any kind of resolution and i'm like wait what yeah that's how i'm like oh that's that's just really disappointing 
Um, overall, again, I like the concept of the story. I like it. I think it's a lot of like interesting potential because, again, it's taking a very, it, it's taking a story that we probably all read a lot, but it's it's twisting that oh, fighting is not what this you know dungeon wants to do. And I think that's that's interesting. And so, um, but the execution itself left me wanting more, and I was definitely disappointed by the unresolved ending. Uh, so for me, it just like gets a score of six out of ten. Again, not bad. It's just like oh, I. I didn't have a good time with it, but it's not boring. Um, so it gets a score of 6 out of 10. So that's 6 out of 10 for Cloud Dungeon, Fairy Wonderland. There you go. Okay. On to Total Quest, Total VR number one by Clay P. Griggs. So there we go. Okay. This one is 210 pages, $2.99. It is available on Kindle Unlimited. Here is the author's description Total Quest. A full immersive virtual reality game is released to the public. As the beta testers prepare for a new release, Ken suits up for the very first time unlocking his personal AGI Vera. The technology offers more than a good time online. The public release of the game brings a new opportunity to get paid to play. When you're the best, companies want you to play for them. Corporate obedience trains friendships and loyalties as the virtual game becomes a real life nightmare when players' minds become the prize. Um, there's a lot of a lot of things in there, um, and not all of them are really developed well. Um, to be fair, again, the this is the author's first novel that he's written and published. Um, he he asked me to um, go into detail on on the things he actually says. He asked me to review it on a, on a technical level and like give him more of a critique review. And again, his request. And he said he's very clear. He's like, I have, I have thick skin. I want to be a better writer. I want to do better. You tell me what you really think and, and don't, you know, uh, and, and be tough because I want to do better. Um, and so I sent him like a full, like detailed report, like a bunch of notes. Um, I took a bunch of notes on the story and of course, thoughts and issues and technical issues. So I, I gave that to him. Um, but so if this review feels a little more uh, critique that that's that, that's why though. Um so here we go. Um, this is the author's debut novel, and you can tell sometimes, um, especially early on the story. Like there are a lot of grammar, tense, and structural issues, like a bunch of little technical things. Um, but the most noticeable like issue on the technical writing side is going to be the fact that the author, on a very regular basis, mixes past and pres tense, uh, present tense in the same sentence structure. Um, and so you'll get like sentences like, "Oh, I'm I'm running to the park, and then I walked, I, I walked to the pond." So it, it, the, the sentences themselves feel um, a little awkward uh, quite often. Um, and again, that, those are just technical writing issues, which can be fixed by Grammarly or getting a different editor or, you know, whatever. Uh, those are those are issues. Um, there are also like story structural issues of the story that, that make it harder to um, to enjoy. Um, the story is again is, is generally a mix of like action raid battles, and in a full in a fully immersive MMO and awakened AI story. Um, it's told from multiple perspectives, and I think I just mentioned before that that's a very challenging narrative structure to get correct. There are six points of views in the story: five players, one artificial intelligence point of view. And by the end of the story, I kind of felt like most of them weren't needed. Like the antagonist is the AI. Okay, it's a little, it's a tiny bit spoiler, um, but the other five characters, I'm like, I, I, I by the end of the trailer, like, oh, they kind of only needed one or two of those. What are the rest of doing? And they didn't really do much in the story, um, and just as like a writing exercise, a multiple person story is again just super challenging. Uh, it has a lot of unique challenges that that aren't, and this, is, I mean, there's a very good reason why a lot of authors, um, especially like amateurs like me and other people, choose to do like your first books in just like one person's point of view or like third person omniscient um, or whatever, uh, just because it's, it's a much easier structure to like tell your story a little bit. Um, but again, these are just choices for the author. I'm not criticizing their choice to do a, a multi-perspective story. It's just that it didn't really work here. Like it felt really cluttered um, because there were so many perspectives. Um, the beginning of the story is like one last raid battle for the beta version of the game organized by like three gamer friends. And then it kind of shifts to a long world storyline uh, where each of the players is either setting up equipment uh, for the full version of the VR game or, or setting up their personal assi uh, yeah, assistance or being offered jobs to play the game full time. Uh, and, and outside a brief scene where one, one player levels in the game at one point. Um, the novel doesn't actually return to the game until like the 56% mark of the story. So like there's a really big real world section of the story um, that honestly doesn't 
do much to advance the like the the the, the story, the plot of the story. Um, there are some funny scenes there. There are some very I actually like the stuff with Ken and his AI. Um, that was probably the most entertaining because because he's a very um, you can empathize with his character a lot, and the AI is a very nice way of like seeing his world and like interpreting like oh it's fresh for her so she asks a lot of questions then asks for explanations like why he does things and that gives you an opportunity to to tell the motivations of the character so i thought that was really well done but like for the, a lot of the other characters the other like four um perspectives i'm like there wasn't a lot of point for them being there to be honest so i'm like they weren't as entertaining they were honestly a little bit like on long term like oh that was that was like there was no reason that was a little boring sorry um and let's see um yeah and then now said um after that again after the 66 percent mark the story stays in the game and it's all about the players and the AI coming together and there's a very interesting story there with a lot of like mmo raid content uh explorations of various npc towns and there's a really nice subplot of like an ai going out of control and trying to escape any way it can and i'm not going to swear like that portion of it because it's like i said it's a nice twist and the um emergent ai concept is it's very interesting here i actually like i think that and like the raid content and um i think those are probably the strong points of the story and that they're very interesting concepts even if like their execution isn't isn't amazing like as a, as, as story concepts i'm like oh those are nice those have a lot of potential so like there, there, there are some really good nice things about the story um game mechanic wise it's kind of light on rpg progression and that's kind of a big thing for me at least because that's what i love about these stories about little rpg in general is that I understand how the game world works and the game mechanics mean something to the story. Um, and while there's a lot of information about how combat works, spells, and skills and classes, um, there are even like some really interesting concepts about like physics and chemistry and way patterns determining class abilities. The actual RPG progression in the story happens of like two places in the entire story. Um, like uh, the 34% mark to the 38 and the 72 to 70%. Like one of the characters levels, I think like once or twice. Uh, and that kind of seems to be his only purpose in the story is to do those couple leveling things. Um, I'm not sure of like what the author's plans for the character, like maybe book two or three, like he becomes super important and he's like, I don't know, the mastermind behind everything. I don't know. But in this novel, like that's kind of all he does. And then like all the other characters, even though they're all players, um, which, with, with the exception of like the antagonist, nobody else levels. Like even though they get into like, these huge rage battles and like these, there's some, there's these amazing, like, like these big farts and lots of killing and lots of XP going out. Nobody else ever levels. And like that, that seems like a huge kind of a mission in, in a little RPG story, at least to me. Um, okay. Uh, and I said, the, like I said, a highlight of the story is probably some of the raid battles. Um, I think they're, they're well described. Like they're, because they're larger structures, they're larger like battle scenes. Um, that to me is like a harder thing to write. Like I'm, personally, I, I, I choose to write small scenes because it's easier for me to like visualize and describe one, two, three, four characters, whatever it is, focusing on the battle. Um, but this, the, these larger read battles might involve like dozens or you know hundreds of people. If the author kind of gives a nice visualization quality of like, oh, they're attacking the left flank because of this reason. They're using these spells for this particular purpose and the enemy's responding in this particular way. And like, oh, that's really, it's, it's quite nice. I'm like, oh, good, good job there. Um, overall though, um, I was kind of bored through like several big sections of the story. Um, and there doesn't really seem to be like a big plot here. Like there's like a, a big conflict at the end. And I, I think that's kind of the plot of the story. Like there's, there's sort of a build up there about like the antagonist, like, doing whatever they're doing again i don't want to i don't want to get too swirly but then there's like this big conflict at the end and it's like oh that's a really cool twist but when you look back at the story it's like a lot of the other portions of like what were what was their point what was their connection to to getting to this big conflict and 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 and, and it's kind of semi-resolution um it didn't didn't feel like everything was really connected and it felt like a lot of it was just like not needed to tell um this particular story like even the story itself is like, there's not a lot of like plotted out story. I think here, like there's like one, again, one big conflict at the end and the rest of it is just like, Oh, like it feels a little more slice of life and that's fine. It really is. I don't have a problem with slice of life, except that again, because this is multi-perspective narrative, because there's like six points of views that are being told six stories that even that slice of life portion feels a little bit scattered because you're following six different people doing random things. It seems like, um, and then some of them come together at the very end. 
and that's and that's kind of what it feels like. It feels it feels a little random that way. Um, so there you go. Um, again, I like I like this overall. Um, I like the sci-fi aspects of it. Again, I like that AI emerging AI concept. Um, the raid content is is well described. Um, but you know, a lot of the story just doesn't feel like it's needed, and it just at the end it definitely peters out. It's like oh. You know, instead of getting like a really solid resolution to like a lot of the story threads that are, you know, uh, that are picked up and, and started in the story, like there's no resolution for 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 quite a few of them, and so that's another issue. Um, for me though, it's just again, I it's gonna get a score of five out of ten, uh, mostly because like I was bored through like several large sections of it. Again, there are also like a lot of other issues with it. Um, again, it's not a it's not necessarily a bad story. It really it's not. There are technical issues, <laughs> technical issues uh, galore. Um, but to me personally, I don't, I don't care. I mean, i I care more about, I should say, being entertainment story, making it interesting, um, having, having good plot lines, making the game mechanics matter to the story, uh, and, and, or just making a story that I find entertaining is, is more important to me than a lot of the technical stuff. Um, but the like said, this has just lots of issues and, 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 and that's okay. It really is like we all progress and write at our own paces. We all learn things, whatever, at every stage we're going to be. And I think one of the biggest things for the, for the author is that he, he, he said, we had a conversation online or I, you know, we kind of talked about these things. He was like, I'm, I'm going to keep doing better. I'm going to take this information. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm then going to use it to make myself a better author and a writer. And like, yay, good for you, man. So good job, Clay, for not giving up uh, and just keep doing it, man. That's, that's the only thing you can do as a writer. You want to get better? keep writing, keep going. And I said, um, so congratulations on putting out a novel and, 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 and taking the first step. And it's a, it's a creative step, honestly, to let other people read your stuff and, and give reviews. Uh, it's, it's really good. Uh, so good job, man. But for me, it does get a score of five out of 10 for total quest, total VR, uh, one. So there you go. And again, folks don't write me, please. The author totally asked. He literally asked for this kind of review. So there it is. Okay. Uh, on to book number four, or sorry, this review number four, The Wayward Bard, World of Chains, book number one, um, written by Lars M. Uh, now, for folks who may not may or may know, Lars M is a, a, a wonderful member of the Little Beach community. Um, I see him posting all the time on Facebook and Twitter and a bunch of other places. He supports the, the community as, as much as possible. So it was really fun for me to uh, to know, like, he wrote a story, just like me. Like, I, I'm, I was a reader, too super fan of the genre and I eventually wrote a thing because of that story in my brain. And, and I said this time and time again, um, a lot of the best stories that I've read in this, in this genre have come from people who are like kind of amateurs who, who don't have like degrees in writing, I should say, who've never maybe written a story before. Um, but they have such a passion for the genre that they end up writing something. And this is kind of one of those cases. So yay Lars, uh, is, is exciting to read it. Um, it is 350 ish pages. I think the last time I checked, it didn't have like a page count on Amazon officially. Um, it is $4.99. It is available on Kindle Unlimited. Here's the author's description. Daniel's guide to early retirement. One, intercept illegal money transfer from mafia boss. Two, hide on in super exclusive full immersion virtual reality game until the heat is off. Three, roll a bard, max out charisma, live it up for profit with all the pesky planning out of the way daniel set out to realize his ultimate dream gaining enough money to buy a tropical island and spend his days playing the violin and rpgs what could possibly go wrong so there you go um the author also gives a very um entertaining disclaimer it says there shall be no harems in this series. Overpowered, perfect and protagonists will not be tolerated and excessive cursing will result in donations to the swear jar so that made me go when I read it, um, most because it kind of shows um, Lars's personality. They put a lot of time and effort into this, and it also shows, you know, how how witty he he, he basically is. So it's very entertaining. Um, and so Lars is writing another very up for screen name, Lars M. So you know, there you go. Uh, now, full disclosure: I did receive a man's copy of this review. I, I per- happily purchased it when it became available. Um, so there we go. Okay, um, here's the review. From the moment you read the novel's witty description and disclaimer, you can tell the author put a lot of time and personality into the novel, and the novel itself does not disappoint. It starts out just like the description says, with the main character, Daniel, on the run from the mob after stealing millions from them. While he, I'm a tiny bit disappointed that it doesn't play a bigger role in the story once the main character gets into the game, it's still one of the more interesting ways of justifying spending all your time in a full immersion VR game. 
um, by the 5% mark, the main character is in the story and he stays there the entire story. So there you go. That's always a plus for me. Um, I like that the main character doesn't have anything handed to him in the story and he suffers for a stupid mistake. That's a really big point. And he dies on a pretty regular basis. Um, and if you, if you've listened to the reviews I've given, uh, over the course of like the last couple of years, you know, that's one of those things that always bugs me. Like in an MMO game or like respawning is, is a way of like learning is learning experience. Why don't more people like use it as, as that? Like why make the character like just never die in a video game? I'm like, it never made sense to me. Like why not use it as an opportunity? Like, Oh, re- expose the character's flaws, give an opportunity to, to grow as a character and as a gamer. And this, this character definitely does that. He dies on a fairly regular basis, um, but he learns from each one of those deaths and he learns how to adjust things. So he dies less. He, he keeps dying sometimes, but it's all again, always, always that experience like, oh, this is a new situation. He has to adjust. He doesn't do it well sometimes. And he just, he dies and he suffers the death penalties, but he still comes back and he keeps going. Um, it's a very interesting aspect of the story. Um, and let's see, uh, another interesting aspect of the story is just how many great stories can be told without combat. And I think that's another big draw that makes this story different from other ones. The main character is a bard. He has a min-max strategy built towards charisma. Um, so he's actually kind of combat challenged, at least in the melee sense. Like he, he tries to do some melee action early in the story and he totally wipes multiple times and he quickly realizes he's going to, he has to adjust um, the way he's doing. Cause he, he planned his character to, to be a bard and to live the high life. Um, and, and that just doesn't work out for him initially. And that, that, that's the, of course, the impotence to him going on these adventures and questing and becoming and growing as a person, um, and as a character, of course, but it also means that there are some very interesting story opportunities when, when you've already set up your main character to, to not be combat efficient. That means you, you, you're almost forcing yourself to think outside the box of, of new ways of telling interesting stories that aren't necessarily entirely combat focused. Um, and that's what's done here. And it's again, a, a very interesting story. And I liked it. I really did enjoy it. Um, there is combat in the story. I'm not trying to say that there isn't, even though I, when I first started me, I thought, oh, is there not going to be any combat at all? And I was happy that there is combat on a, on a semi-regular basis in the story, but it's, it's just not, the main character just has to adjust to how he fights. Um, so there we go. Um, and of course the most interesting part of the story kind of have, don't have anything to do with fighting. There's music, um, there's storytelling, there's lore gathering, there's crafting, there's world building, there's game three, and most importantly, there's mystery investigation. Um, and that's kind of the big thing for the story. The big plot is of the story revolves around solving this big mystery and a lot of other like seemingly unrelated quest, kind of providing the puzzle pieces that the main character uses to, to ultimately solve that big, big old mystery. Um, but again, another note that I kind of want to touch on the bard thing really well done like i mean as far as like um i'm not a music person personally i listen to music on a like a fairly rare race basis i used to listen to it more when i drove more um but i'm, I'm just music isn't like a huge part of my life so um it was hard for me it would be hard for me to write a bard story where like music is the way they live is the way really important to them and the author really did a really good job like i really appreciated how how much of an impact music has, not just for this character as like a, as, as a bard, but also as like the, the real person behind the character. He, he, um, one of the things about the story is that there are no like auto knowledge aspects to like skills. So if you want to fight with the sword, you actually have to learn how to fight with the sword or know in advance how to fight with the sword. Otherwise you're going to suck. Like your skills may give you better chances for critical hits or better damage or whatever. But if you don't know how to wield that sword, you know, your SOL. Um, same thing with like using musical instruments. The main character chose to be a bard because he knew already knew how to play musical instruments and he kind of like that, that kind of character. Um, but there's just like a really interesting narrative, especially like when he first becomes a bard and he gets his first musical instrument where it's like, oh, there's like a nice description, like, oh, what it means to be a musician and how music impacts you and how the state of mind that the musician gets into in, in, in playing. And I thought it was a nice uh, perspective that I had never personally experienced because again, I'm a, a music person. Um, so that was kind of fun for me as well. Um, overall though, I had a good time reading the story. I really did. Um, it's a good mix of adventuring, mystery solving, but there's still like a really great RPG built character building that I'm a big fan of. Um, uh, lots of great RPG mechanics that are described in, in great detail, which I'm again, a super fan of. So the author not only creates a great character, but he also does like really rich world building. There's a lot of information about this story world, this game world, um, that is just like weaved 
seamlessly into the story because that's also part of like the quest system and the, and the character skill set. Um, but they're fun. There's just so many fun stories here. So um, gets a score of seven out of ten for me. Um, it'd, it'd probably be closer to like a seven, seven, seven point seven, seven point eight. Um, really close to a, like an eight for me. It's just not quite. Um, but like I said, go big recommendation. Go check it out. That's the Wayward Bard Book of Chains, book number one, uh, with a score of seven out of ten. So there you go. Okay, on to book review number five, Countdown Reality Benders, book number one, written by Michael Atzmanov. Um, you might recognize the name from the um, the Dark Herbalist. Sorry, there. Brain sneeze. Uh, Dark Herbalist series, I believe. So here we go. It is a 459 pages, $3.99. It's available on Kindle Unlimited. Here's the author's description. At long last... An extraterrestrial civilization reached out and made the first contact. Uh, however, no one on Earth took their communique very for the genuine article. In a similar vein, very few people appreciated just how little time our new Surzens had uh, promised to keep our planet safe. Regardless, the end of their message showed humankind how to access a mysterious game. The objective of this game is unclear. No one can say where its servers are located, and its inner workings are beyond comprehension, but the game slowly gained momentum, pulling in more and more players. Soon enough, the game became impossible to ignore, and the, the fact that things that happened in the game had a direct impact on reality, and not only ours. But as people figured out this mysterious system, the countdown timer took it away, and no one can say exactly what will happen when Earth's safety is no longer guaranteed. Okay, there it is. Um... Full disclosure, again, I received a man's copy of the novel for review. I purchased it when it became available. Um, now, the, the the novel description doesn't do a really good job of like, describing what's actually happening in the story. Um, the, the premise for the story is really similar to the game, which is GAM3. Um, humanity is in contact by an alien civilization. We now have like a limited time to, to enter this reality-bending game and prove ourselves worthy to enter the larger galactic system. Um, if we don't, once our safe time runs out, we'll be fair game for the more aggressive species in the universe. At least that's the bigger macro storyline of the series. Uh, the micro storyline of the series is a lot simpler. The main character, uh, Kirill, or Nat, which is his game character name, um, he's called into a game to play this game... <laughs> He's actually blackmailed into playing the game um, to help his faction progress. Uh, that's like the Russian pro uh, faction where he's where he's at. Um, his willingness to break the rules imposed by superiors and play the game like only a veteran game junkie can uh, lets him progress faster than anyone thought possible and have lots of adventures and impactful uh, story questing. Uh, the story is mostly a stylized adventure that's well organized, and you see recurring antagonists come back again and again to make trouble for the main character. Unlike the Dark Herbalist, um, there's very very little real life storyline, um, which might be a plus for somebody, negative for others. Um, game mechanic wise, there's like the standard like stat system where it's a strength, con, agility, intelligence, wisdom, cha uh, charisma, luck. Uh, there are additional stats like perception, which play like a really big role for the main character in this particular instance uh, to like notice things. And there's other like subtleties within the game system. Um, the class system that apl uh, applies firm restrictions on non combat related uh, on what uh, things classes can do. So this is a class system with like some really strong restrictions. So the main character chooses a multi class, which means he can't do certain things. Like he can't wear super heavy armor. He can't use automated weapons. He can't um, fly any kind of vehicle. Um, and those restrictions are very firmly held. Like there's no there's no wand waving that lets the main character um, go over these restrictions, which to me is, is always a nice plus when your when your world um, rules and your game rules are super firm and they actually have an impact on the story. Because there's several places like it would have been really simple for the main character to jump in a vehicle and just race away, except that he literally can't. Like there's a, there's a system in place that stops him from doing so, and so th there are things he has to do to kind of um, make his escape or, or do things. Um, so there's also a skill-based system where you practice your skills um, and the more you practice your skills plus like other actions you do in the game get you levels which increase things like health and you know whatever else stamina um, and if you've read the Dark Herbalist a lot of these um, mechanics are going to feel familiar like I think there's some crossover um, but it's a, it's a, it's a really in-depth system which I enjoyed um, overall again this is a lot of sci-fi adventuring um, I liked it. I had a good time reading it. Uh, it's never a boring story. The RPG mechanics and always RPG mechanics always feel like they're important and they're impactful to story. But a lot of it is just like sci-fi adventuring, which is why it reminds me of the game a lot. Um, I, I, there's going to be like a larger like series arc point, I'm sure. 
Um, and there's some really cool stories in there, which I won't spoil for anybody, but it, it's fun sci- sci-fi adventuring. Uh, so I had a good time with it. Um, gets a score of 7 out of 10. Um, relatively, I'd probably give it a closer like a 7.5 score. Like it was good. Really, like quite nice. Um, that's a score of 7 out of 10 for Countdown Reality Benders, book number one. Lit RPG series. Uh, there you go. Another good story. Okay, on to last one. The Iron Veil, a little RPG Omni World Adventure, written by Randy Nargi. Nargi. Okay. Uh, it is 394 pages, $4.99, available on Kindle Unlimited. Um, here's the author's description. Westworld meets Game of Thrones in this thrilling, exceptionally realistic game world. Uh, it's not just a game, it's a nightmare. 25-year-old Justin Boone has been waiting his entire life for an adventure like this. Breakthrough technology developed at the government's sleep study program allows participants to interact with each other in an omni-world, a shared dream state that resembles an online role-playing game. 2.3 million people applied to participate in the first public test. 5,000 were chosen, and Justin is one of them. But he soon finds that he's not one of the lucky ones, not by a long shot. And I must face legendary monsters, murderous assassins, and other players bent on his destruction as a diabolical AI game controller who has plans for his own. Enjoying this... Okay, now this this next one is like... The, the next two paragraphs are just like advertisements for like, oh, this is a little RPG game-led adventure book free of uh, free as part of your Kindle Limited Prime reading subscription, and it isn't really telling you about the story. Uh, but there's literally like two paragraphs worth of... Um, attempts to get keyword searches uh, from Amazon here. Like there's literally 20 um, keyword plugs here. And, and kind of, this is one of my first clues, like, oh, this is like kind of a red flag and that, oh, this might might be one of those um, right to market lit RPG stories. Um, and under like literally 20 words in the next two paragraphs, which is plugs for keywords, like sci-fi, fantasy, lit RPG, game, like adventure book, fantasy, epic fantasy, epic fantasy book, fantasy adventure, new fantasy books, sword and sorcery, science fiction, cyberpunk, fantasy adventure quest, action adventure, men's adventure, fantasy, superhero, fantasy, uh, heroic fantasy, fantasy, history, fantasy, humorous fantasy, and Kindle Unlimited books. Literally, it's a whole stream of stuff there. Um, and for me, the rest of the story, this whole story does feel like it's kind of right to market or like it was it was there's like this concept here of like this mystery sci-fi a awakening thing and oh let's let's try to put it into that litter of d stuff and we'll we'll add some game mechanics um and that's kind of what it feels like to me at least um the rest of the story the story there's some entertaining moments in the story I'm, I'm not gonna say there's not um but it's kind of a frustrating experience at least for me because it feels like a lot of the plot is is intentionally stretched out and, and, and this huge mystery. Um, and also like the game stuff doesn't really matter to that plot. Um, and, and some of the things like you can tell like this is kind of the case is that there there are there are details about the death mechanics in the story in the beginning and they're, they're pretty well detailed. Um, but outside of that, there's not a lot of details about like abilities, skills, or even like some of the things that are stated in like the one character sheet you see in the story. Uh, like what the heck is combat action or combat opposition? I don't know. I've never explained what these things are, but they're, they're, these are titles that are used in like the main character's one character sheet when you see it. Um, so I'm like, oh, okay. And, and that's kind of how I, you get a lot of the game information. Like, it's set in MMO, it is, um, and there are experience points given, and you see people's levels, and you see people like NPC names, um, and people when they do things like they'll use spells or abilities, and you get a name for them, um, but you don't actually get like any kind of descriptions either for the main character and the things he does or for what other people do. Um, so you're really limited on the amount of like actual detail, like what the nitty gritty things in the story are, and that's always like a sign of like, oh, somebody doesn't either care enough about these things to include it, which is a choice, or like it ultimately doesn't matter to the big story uh, and they don't want to waste their time to it. And that's kind of what it feels like in this story. Like the game things don't, like all those details don't really matter to the story. Like they're not going to impact it one way or another ultimately. So why bother writing those details? Like the VR system matters. The, the fact that it, there's an artificial intelligence somewhere who's kind of gone rogue and doing weird things and changing the game world and changing quest lines, that matters. Um, but like all those fine game details, like, ah, eh, not so much. So what's the point? And that's what it feels like. And whether it's true or not, um, you, you can decide if you want to read it. Um, but for me, it felt like, oh, that, that's the reason I'm not getting this stuff. Um, so I'm like, okay, that, that's just, that's a choice. Uh, it's just like, oh, that's, 
it's not an entertaining choice to me. Um, let's see. And let's see, anything else? Oh, um, and again, it is like my starter mouse. Um, and a lot of the plot, I guess this is kind of another point for me. Like when I'm reading the story, the plot doesn't really reveal itself right away. And I think that's part, I mean, that, that, that seems very intentional in the story in that the plot and like what's happening behind the scenes with the quest and the, and the game company real life, all that seems to be like this big mystery that the, that the author's trying to stretch out as part of like the plot, except that for me, it feels like, oh, the premise of the story is a mystery and the actual plot of the story is a mystery. Um, and so that's just kind of a frustrating experience for me as a reader because I don't understand what's happening in the story behind, like what's the real story here in the novel. It's definitely not slice of life. Um, and because I don't understand what's happening, it makes me feel like, oh, the other things that are happening outside of like this real mystery is like, they don't really matter. And it's like the entire story is a little bit frustrating for me. However, my biggest issue with the story, um, is kind of the fact that the main characters don't, I don't, I don't really have any reason to care about them. And this was kind of a common complaint in some of the other reviews on Amazon and that the characters felt flat. They felt, um, like it, I don't have a reason to care about them. Um, and, and that, that I can, that was the same for me. Like I, at the end of this novel, I don't actually really know why these characters exist and why are they playing this game in the first place? Like there are some hints in the story, like, Oh, we were recruited and like, there might be a million dollar prize here. And if, um, and they're stuck here for a year. Um, but those revelations occur like almost as casual throwaway lines in the story. Like at one point, the main character is, he's in character creation. And okay, this is a little spoiler. If you want to hear it, please skip. Um, but the main character is in character creation. And he, he he's talking to his AI who's helping him figure things out, like what, what his class is going to be, the game rules and stuff. And the, the AI is saying, he's, his, he's saying, oh, you know the death rules, right? And the main character says, oh, and I, I kind of forgot about them. And there's an explanation, like, oh, what, what the death rules are. Um, that up until level five, you get unlimited deaths. And then after level five, you get a three strike rule, like you get three deaths and then you're out of the game, out of the system entirely. And each one of those three deaths, you have a, your character's wiped and you have to start completely over. Um, but at the end, it's like, there's a statement that's like, oh, and if you finish those three deaths, you're just kicked to the game and you can't win the million dollars. And then that's the end of the statement. And everybody in that conversation, just like, oh, they just move on really quickly past it. And I, for me as a reader, I'm like, that seems like a really important motivation for like why this guy's here. Why don't I learn more about that? And it's never really expanded upon in the story. And again, this happens later on. Like there are these, these like these throwaway lines. I feel like they could be like very important motivations for the characters and why they exist in this story. But they're just like, they're like throwaway sentences. Like, oh, by the way, if we die in the game, our minds are wiped. Our memories are completely wiped. Oh, well, let's go. Let's just keep moving on this adventure. And I'm like, oh, that's I'm like, I'm like, okay, that, that seems important. Why aren't I getting more information about that? Or why wasn't there something about that at the beginning that that's how this game world works? Um, and there's a lot of that within the story. And it's just like, I, I, it's just the feeling that the author is intentionally again, drawing out the mystery of what this world is, what the premise is. Like the premise feels like it's a mystery. Like not the mystery of like the things that are happening, but what's the actual premise of the story and the plot? That feels like a mystery that the author is like, gradually like leaving bread comes around for you to discover as you're reading the story. I'm like, okay, that's, that's a frustrating experience, at least for me. Um, overall, the, the, the story feels like a cyber thriller by the end of the novel with some added RPG mechanics that don't really ultimately matter to like the big mystery in the story. And honestly, it just didn't work for me at all. I didn't have a good time with it. Um, it gets a score four out of 10 for me. Um, that's the Iron Veil, a little bit Omni World adventure <laughs> with the score of four out of 10. So there you go. That's it. Uh, that's it, everybody. Yeah, that is actually, we're done with our reviews. <laughs> Um, thank you, Hank, for hanging out with me, for listening to me talk about this great stuff. Um, remember, you can follow us on Facebook, on Twitter, YouTube, Patreon, on our webpage, uh, all those definite places you can hang out uh, and, and see the things that we're doing, see all the content we're creating. We have a bunch of like uh, author interviews on our website and our YouTube page and a bunch of other places. So go check them out. Go support us any way you can. And if you want to support us in any way, shape, or form, you can find out all the ways you do so at litrpgpodcast.com slash support. So again, everybody, thank you for hanging out with me. Um, you can, for and until we can hang out again, ladies and gentlemen, uh, remember to go read some Lord RBG. Goodbye, everybody.